department at the University of North Florida in August of 2016 as the head strength conditioning coach. He primarily oversees men's and women's basketball, baseball, volleyball, and beach volleyball. His prior stops include the University of Pittsburgh, Hofstra University, the University of Rhode Island, Salisbury University, Springfield College, and the University of South Florida. Along with being a strength and conditioning coach, Burke was an adjunct professor at Hofstra. Burke also assisted in the presentation of the alternative paradigm training at Georgetown University in 2012 and on ACL prevention and rehabilitation at Springfield College, both of which were NSCA recognized strength and conditioning clinics. Burt earned his master's degree in applied health physiology at Salisbury University. Coach Brian Burt is certified through the NSCA as a strength or certified strength and conditioning specialist, as well as through the CSCCA as a strength and conditioning coach certified. And he is also precision nutrition level one certified also. So without further ado, Coach Brian Burt. I'm going to attempt to not use the mic. Um, I'm a little bit more of an animated person, so I use my arms. Can everybody hear me all right in the back? Yeah. Are we good? Thank you. Um, so, great introduction. Uh, obviously, excited to be here. Um, he just gave a great rundown of, of my uh, experiences and, and how I got to where I am now. Um, obviously, the field takes you a lot of places. Uh, met a lot of great mentors along the way that kind of shaped me into who I am. Um, starting off my first internship at University of South Florida with Coach McKeithrey there. Uh, to kick me off into the field. I don't think I could have had a better mentor than him. Um, and then as well as to carry me throughout the field from there. Um, going from there, I went to University of Rhode Island, which I interned in the summer of my junior year. Uh, lucky enough to do a good job there and get called back. Um, great tenure there, uh, two years. Realized I kind of needed to further my education if I wanted to continue to grow in the field. And that's when I decided to go to grad school. Where I went to grad school, very interesting situation, Salisbury University in, in, in Salisbury, Maryland. Uh, the head strength coach there, Matt Nine, was the NCA Strength and Conditioning Coach of the Year in 2018. Um, amazing human being, does an excellent job. I actually stole some slides from him um, up here, so I gotta give him credit for that. Um, but does a great job with what he's got as far as facilities and, and working with Division Three athletes and, and that whole voluntary aspect and getting buy-in and things like that. So um, learning at a small school like that and how to get your athletes to buy into what you're doing was, was crucial in my development uh, to get, get me to where I am. Um, from there, I went to Hofstra University in, in Long Island, New York, um, and then on to take the assistant head job at University of Pittsburgh. Uh, great opportunity at Pitt. Um, enjoyed my tenure there, worked baseball and track and field. Um, got some of the administrative duties under my belt while I was there, and then I was kind of excited to take my leap into, into the head strength and conditioning world um, and kind of implement the, the stuff that I had learned over the years. Um, just so you guys got a little bit of understanding of what we work with, uh, we've got about a 3,500 square foot facility. Uh, we are located in a, a stadium, so that 3,500 square feet is a slanted ceiling that condenses us down a little bit more. Um, but we have six strength uh, racks and six Olympic platforms, um, various implements. We pretty much have all the stuff that we need um, to run our program. Here's just some pictures. As you can see, we have the racks separated off from the um, uh, platform separated off from the racks. It gives us a little bit more sp uh, space. We don't have the filler pieces uh, to fill in between the racks, but I actually like this better because if I got a team of 34 guys in there with baseball, um, I can have half the team on the platforms, half in the rack, and kind of spread it out and have a little more flow. Um, and then next picture. You can see our dumbbell section. We put all our machines based around the walls. Our dumbbell section's in the middle a little bit. Um, gives us a little bit movement area. We can move those benches out of the way. Um, and we do have alleyways on the back side as well to kind of get that movement prep type stuff in. Um, so not the biggest facility, uh, but I certainly have no complaints. I'm grateful for where, at and, and where I'm at. And then we get a lot done with what we have here. Uh, to kind of kick this presentation off, this is what I stole from Matt Nine at Sal Salisbury. does a great job. Um, this is a, a study on Reese's monkeys on uh, skilled acquisition of learning. So basically the study was they put a bunch of monkeys in a room, they put a ladder in the room and put some bananas up on top. Uh, every time a monkey went to go climb up the ladder, uh, the scientists would then spray the other monkeys with cold water on the ground. After a little while, um, every time a monkey went up the ladder, the other monkeys would beat that monkey up and obviously not let him up the ladder because they knew they were going to get squirt. Um, <clears throat> after some time, no monkeys dared to go up the, the ladder regardless of the temptation. 
Scientists then decided to substitute one of the monkeys out. The first thing the new monkey did was go up the ladder. After several beatings, the new mon monkey learned not to, not to climb the ladder, um, even though he never knew why. Uh, the second mon monkey was then substituted, the third, and so on and so on. And before you knew it, you had five new monkeys in the room with none of them understanding why you don't climb the ladder. Uh, and, and none of these monkeys have ever even received a cold shower, so they don't, they don't quite get it. So um, if possible to ask why they would beat up the monkey who went up uh, the ladder, the question probably would be, I don't know, it's just the way things are done. Right? And I think this can be implied into our field on, on how we do things every day. Um, do we know why we do what we do? All right? And there's a lot of different terms out there. Um, people do static stretching versus dynamic, different core routines, bracing versus floor-based, um, athletic type abs, uh, sp uh, specific population, sport group, individual, training age, I think is a very important one. I always give a little side note on this one. I had an administrator bring me his son, said, hey, can you train my son? He's a basketball player. The guy who walked in the door, he was 6'4", 195. Um, I was like, awesome, I'm gonna have some fun with this one. Great frame on him, then I know he was 14 years old. All right, and that's very important to understand. Um, obviously biological age, but the training age of him. Um, didn't know how to move very well. Um, obviously couldn't put him in as much as advanced as he looked walking through the door. Um, training gender, training sport, uh, group-based conditioning, um, optimal training zones, all this stuff is very, very important. And I kind of reference social media a lot as well with this. Not that social media is a bad thing, but a lot of times we find some things on social media and we start implementing with our athletes without always fully understanding what we're doing and why we're doing it. We might be able to spit back whatever that post said or wherever we heard it from, but we don't really know the in-depths of why we're doing it. And I think that's very, very important to, to whatever you implement with your athletes that you understand it fully uh, before implementing it. Uh, today we're going to talk about pre-screening, um, a little bit on pre-screening. Some of this stuff should be reviewed for you guys. I'm just going to give you guys a little practical application of how we interpret our screening numbers. Uh, pre-screening is one of the most essential parts of, of program design. You can use qualitative and quantitative measures to assess each athlete. Obviously identifying individual deficiencies and allowing to make adjustments into your programs. We're going to talk about what we call Osprey packages towards the end. That's a great way of how we implement our um, screening numbers and corrective exercise into our program in a collegiate setting. Um, in turn, obviously, you're going to help the athletes reach their maximum potential. Um, and research related to movement-based assessments is extremely limited, mainly because we only have a few movement-based quantitative um, assessment tests that are being utilized out there. And obviously the most uh, popular one is the functional movement screen. Um, <clears throat> why screen? What, why is it so important? I mean, if you think about everything that we do in daily life, every time we go to a doctor, every time we walk into a dentist, um, they always screen us, so why don't we screen our athletes? Uh, when it comes to, to see us, why would it be any different? You know, practical use is key. How do we interpret it? How do we implement the information that we gather? An example I always use down here is the easiest measure you can do is body weight. Um, you could do body weight. I know for us as strength coaches, we do it every Monday uh, when our teams walk in the door. Our athletic trainers may do it pre and post practice to assess hydration loss. But one of the most easy measures that gives you some information. Is it going to give you a direct tell to anything? Not necessarily, but at least it's something to start collecting and kind of watch um, throughout the year as your athletes go through. The FMS screen, um, simple, simple tool, uh, comprised of seven uh, tests to, to rank functional movement patterns. Um, you can obtain the certification. This isn't a, a cell for FMS. I do not have the certification. Um, we just look into it and utilize the tools off of it um, and implement it how it works for us. The screen attempts to, to pinpoint weak areas in movement patterns, which will then allow for improved exercise prescription and performance. Um, this can be the first line of defense against injury reduction. Uh, and I think that's very important. I always make sure I say injury reduction out there. I try not to say injury prevention because I don't want anybody coming back to me and say, coach, you told me you could prevent my injury and I'm injured. All right, if I could prevent your injury, I'd be a millionaire and, and probably sitting on the beach somewhere with, with a nice cocktail. Um, <laughs> So injury reduction is, is the most important thing and to kind of uh, uh, instill that into our athletes that, that it, it, the screening process as a whole is going to be our first line of defense for those things. Uh, the screening uh, is a starting point for a system of evaluation and exercise prescription that attempts to improve communication and collaboration um, between the sports medicine and exercise science, scientists. 
uh, profession. So we do an excellent job working with our athletic training um, staff and, and kind of working back and forth with some of these tools that we make sure we're dialing in everything for our athletes as much as possible. And I didn't touch on it too, too much, and I'll, I'll definitely touch on it again towards the end. Um, I'm currently short staffed right now. It's myself and, and, and one other um, part-time assistant that we're running all 17 varsity sports. So communication and evaluation to put the best program out for our athletes is essential. You know, otherwise, at, at times like this, when we're really scrambled, people tend to just fly stuff out. But um, trying to keep that bar held high and do all the things correct is important for um, obviously our athletes' health and well-being. Um, FMS's attempt to increase efficiency and effectiveness of qualitative data uh, in collection with respect to human performance. By doing this, um, we can track major limitations, the right to left asymmetries or imbalances within the body. Um, these limitations can cause compensatory movements and patterns, which can then create um, weak links within the body and obviously affect our performance. Here's just a quick example um, of the seven tests, and again, a lot of us have probably seen them before. Deep squat, I, I think it's one of the best tests out there, one of the most telling, um, how much that you can see when someone's doing that deep squat position. Um, and always get different views on it. Obviously, you can look at them straight on, you can look at it from the side, you can look at it from the back. Um, the hurdle step, the inline lunge, shoulder mobility, active straight leg raise, trunk stability, rotational stability. And again, the FMS just put these together because they found that um, to be the most telling and beneficial for them. Uh, kind of take what you can use best in your program and implement it from there. The scoring system is pretty simple for this, um, but it does give us that data, which is important. Um, so award a score of three if the athlete performs it with no functional movement patterns in there. Um, Award a score to two if, if they can perform it, but there is some sort of compensation that they're doing to be able to perform that. And then a score to one if they're unable to perform it. And then pretty easy zero if they have pain doing it. Right? If they have pain doing any of the tests, immediately remove them from it uh, and, and try some, uh, a different measure. Uh, scoring interpretation. So I think this is the biggest thing, especially in a group setting, um, on, on how you interpret these results for the FMS. Um, FMS sum scores usually range between that 13 and 15. Many trials show norms around 14. Um, higher scores are not always indicative of uh, more efficient movement patterns, although they do tend to relate towards better athletic performance. Um, utilize, again, the screen what works best for you. Interpreting more with the, uh, the FMS, so this is what we try to do. Um, look at all the compensatory patterns that take place. Some good examples that I normally use is the hurdle step. So obviously in the hurdle step, um, we got the ball on our back, we're stepping over uh, the line, trying to tap our heel to the ground. But what are we looking at? Are we always just looking at that moving leg and kind of how it's getting up and over? Are we taking the whole body approach and looking at what they're doing? So is there a hip shift as soon as they pick their leg up? How severe is the hip shift? Um, what's their opposite leg doing to stabilize? A lot of times I see the muscles in the foot kind of firing like crazy trying to stabilize that body while it's up on one leg. So really try to look into that and look into the whole body approach. This is why I get a little bit off. I mean, FMS does a great job, but I try to evaluate more um, as much as possible from that movement. And then I'll show you how we implement it as we go forward. The straight leg raise I just think is an interesting one. Um, I always use Usain Bolt as an example. If I lie him on his back and ask him to do a, a, an active straight leg raise, do you think it's going to be any pretty? Probably not. It's probably going to look like this. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to drill it into him every single day just so we can get a higher score on my FMS group. Alright, so i got to take some practicality in that and understand um, that I might work hamstring mobility with him through active range of motion, but I'm not necessarily going to lie him on his back and say, hey, you got to get past this dowel for your able to run. Alright, if I do that and I keep drilling him, he's probably going to change his run mechanics probably going to lose some elastic, elasticity of the muscles and tendons. Um, so obviously just get a practical use for uh, the tests that they have. Effectiveness of some data is better than no data. Uh, time consuming with large groups. So I originally, and I've been doing this for a while, a lot of times um, I did it all by hand by myself. I didn't always have athletic trainer support or people there to help me. Uh, and it takes time. I know just when I first took the job at North Florida, it took me about three and a half hours to run through the whole baseball team by myself. Um, so it, it does take time, um, but it does give you a number. And then again, just understanding this total number, is it practical that we're gonna get someone to go from a 15 to a 21? You know, do we need to make this number known to our student athletes? Because uh, again, most people are gonna fall in that 14 or 15 range, but I don't wanna beat them down and say, and then retest them over and over. Coach, I'm only at a 16 now. 
You know, I think um, using the numbers is a good thing, uh, but also what we interpret and what we can take out of the tests are essential. Just some research on it here, um, some collegiate athletes. Um, results show that uh, the score of 14 or below combined with self-reported past history, we're at a 15 times increased risk. Uh, positive likelihood of 5.8 uh, was calculated with improved the probability of predicting injury, 33% pre-test uh, to 74% um, post-test. Um, conclusion pretty much adds the growing body of evidence demonstrating a predictive relationship between FMS and um, scores with past history of injury with development of future injury. Um, this is just uh, Gray Institute. I just wanted to give a quick example of this. There's a, a little three minute video. If we can't get it, it's okay. Um, Gray Institute in the 3D maps is a, a pretty easy movement protocol thing. So a lot of people use that in warm up. I had an assistant bring it to me when I used to work um, at University of Pittsburgh, um, the, the uh, Lemieux Center out there in the, the UPenn, uh, the Penn uh, Elite tend to use this a lot, if you just scroll down a little bit, right there on the right. Um, tend to use this a lot, it's a pretty easy measure, um, cheap and easy to get, you can get a certification on it. Uh, like I said, you can use this as a grading tool to screen your athletes, or you can just use it as general warm-ups. Uh, great triplanar movements, getting you all sorts of different directions that obviously your athletes encompass when they compete. Um, so you can go ahead and play Maps, 3D Movement Analysis and Performance System a new innovative and revolutionary certification for the movement industry. 3D Maps is the most powerful certification of its kind. Practitioners certified in 3D Maps will have the knowledge and skill sets to analyze the entire three-dimensional spectrum of human movement, as well as have access to a functional and robust performance system for ongoing enhancement. With no equipment needed, 3D Maps addresses real-life function by observing natural, upright movements of the body as it deals with gravity and ground reaction forces. Utilizing six vital transformational zones, 3D Maps analyzes both the range of motion and the control of motion throughout the entire body and all three planes of motion, thus making it the most functional, complete, and accurate assessment in the industry. Through six mobility analysis movements, analyzing the individual's range of motion, and six stability analysis movements, analyzing the individual's control of motion, all 66 joint motions of the body's primary complexes are covered. Movement analysis results in a relative success code that is unique to each individual being assessed. The relative success code, an algorithm based on the success of the movement patterns, provides the practitioner with direction in enhancing the overall function of the individual. Once the relative success code is determined, it is directly applied to the analysis movements and the performance movements. The performance movements consist of 14 different mobility progressions and 14 different stability progressions, all enhancing the overall function and abilities of the individual allowing all individuals to progress towards their needs, wants, and goals. All the analysis and performance movements featured and utilized throughout 3D Maps are supported on an exclusive online exercise library and included in a dedicated and easy-to-use iOS mobile app, making it easier than ever to both create and share movements and programs. Practitioners can be certified in 3D Maps entirely online or through a one-day live event, which includes the online assets for even more value. 3D Maps empowers movement professionals of all backgrounds with the knowledge, skills, and support to transform the lives of their patients and clients. Become 3D Maps certified at GrayInstitute.com. Okay, so obviously it's a certification that, that you can obtain. Um, like I said, we've used it for warm-ups. I found it effective uh, with my basketball guys. I know it kind of looks silly when you got a bunch of tall guys doing that type of stuff. Um, but it's a lot of times the types of things that they see on the court um, when they got caught in, caught in some of those awkward situations. Um, like I said, it's a low-cost low certification, but also a pretty easy tool that you can learn and kind of implement in your own. Um, Fusionetics is something that we've switched to more recently. Um, so we actually had a little bit of a contact with Fusionetics and were able to get the software. A little bit more expensive than an FMS and uh, the 3D maps, um, but definitely, definitely worthwhile. Uh, it's a technology-enabled performance healthcare system designed to test, score, and create training programs utilized through a computer app or tablet. Um, you can have team dashboards, athlete management profiles. You can standardize digital testing applications for performance, movement, and recovery, um, which is why I like it. Um, and then you get instant targeted programming based on the athletes um, with the ability to customize the programming as well. 
So kind of similar to the FMS, they have their standard testing. Um, so their double leg squat, double leg squat with heel lift, their single leg squat, their push up, um, shoulder internal external rotation, flexion, abduction, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, and then as you can see right here on the right side is kind of how it scores. So this is what we'll see on the phone or on a tablet and kind of how we'll um, just assess those areas as it goes through. Um, so there's a couple different tests in there. So, sorry, that was the movement efficiency test um, was that one. This one here is a range of motion test. So if you have a goniometer, you can actually test all these. So we tend to go into these a little bit more if we're seeing some significant issues or if we're not finding out kind of what's wrong. Um, we stick to more of the movement efficiency test to screen all of our athletes. Um, and then if we have the time, smaller teams and stuff, we'll put them through the full range of motion testing. And then the R&R &R testing I, I, I found to, to be a big fan of. Um, it, it's pretty simple questions. It takes about probably about eight minutes to run through, probably less than that, um, that our athletes can do on their phones. We try to make it a requirement of them. Um, whether we have them do it when they walk into the training room or the weight room, they kind of fill it out for the day. Um, or if it's program, they put reminders on their phone that they fill it out at 8 a.m. in the morning for the previous day. It gives us all those numbers. Um, but it assesses things like hydration, meals, um, refuel snacks, uh, sleep, relaxation, stretch, body function of just how you're feeling. Um, and then restore methods uh, used to prepare the body will then come out of it. Or just asking kind of what you've done with them as well. And then you can use it for performance testing, uh, height, weight, body fat, standing reach, so all these in there. Fusionetics originally came out or is most dominantly used in basketball. A lot of the NBA uses it, um, so all the NBA combine tests are in there. Um, we don't really use it for the, the performance testing. Obviously, we do all of our own performance testing, but it does have the platform there for you to be able to submit it all in. Um, and then here's kind of what it's going to show you. So it gives you its grading systems. It's going to tell you poor, moderate, or good. Um, based on off the screening. These are some of the feedback images that we get off of it. So you can kind of see those target areas or those red areas that need to be assessed a little bit more. And again, we don't live and die by these things. We just look at them as little red flags and then we'll kind of look into them a little bit more as we go. And again, it's all a collaboration between um, our staff and, and athletic training. Um, so then it's gonna give you that mean score down at the bottom, movement efficiency score, um, and kind of classify you from there. This right here are the programs that it spits out. So it'll actually give you its rehab protocol um, from the app and it'll tell you whatever it may be, roll your adductors, piriformis. Um, it can actually give you the, the sets and reps and duration of it. So this we utilize a lot when our athletes leave campus. Um, obviously our athletic trainers are, or we could take care of stuff in the weight room, but when they're home for, for summer break or winter break, uh, it's pretty easy because they have their rehab protocols right there on their phone that they can implement them as they go. Um, it'll then uh, formulate the specific rehab protocols. We utilize them, uh, restore and recover with our athletes when away. Um, we do not solely rely on it. It gives us um, feedback within conjunction with our, our own practical assessment used in the field um, of athletic training and strength and conditioning. It's still subjective. Obviously every person that tests it may test a little bit differently. What we try to do is standardize our teams across our department that we're just having the same eye retest the same teams over and over again. Um, while it does give us qualitative numbers, it is not an end-all be-all, and I think that is very, very important. Um, not everyone is symmetrical, and not everyone's going to be symmetrical. Um, we look for yellow flags or red flags. Yellow flag is obviously a caution of something that we might see that could potentially cause risk down the, the, down the way, um, and that will usually stay with us, implementing the Osprey packages, which we'll talk about. Um, and then continue to ma maintain an open line of communication with our athletic trainers or our sport coaches if necessary um, on how they're doing. And then our red flags, anything substantial that we see, obviously we're gonna send out to our athletic um, trainers, we'll have further evaluation. If we need to see physicians and doctors, we'll go from there. So implementing the screening numbers, I think is the most important part, whether you're in a, a high school setting um, or any sort of group setting as a whole, um, especially if short staffed. Um, that's when it becomes a, a difficult thing. So we go by our 80-20 rule. So 80% of the issues that we see across our team um, we'll incorporate into our program uh, as far as in warm-ups or what we call our movement prep or muscle firing for the day. Um, the individualized 20% will then assign our Osprey packages. Um, any substantial red flags, again, will be addressed with our, our ATs and our athletic trainers. And then basic preventative maintenance, maintenance and care is assessed through cohesion between both rooms um, throughout the year. 
So what we did was create Osprey packages. I actually got this from an old school football mentality when I interned down at South Florida. They had what they called, uh, I think they were called blitz packages back then. They were little bicep blow up packages or tricep or shrug packages, whatever they were to put some size on people. So I thought that was awesome. Unfortunately, I got out of football um, and, and wanted to utilize it in a different way. So what I did was created um, 12 categories that we found um, were the most problematic type areas uh, and broke those up. Um, you can see right here, we've got hip, uh, hip mobility, hand mobility, thoracic, we broke up into two, rotation and extension, um, ankle mobility, shoulder mobility, ankle proprioception, shoulder prehab, knee prehab, um, core, and then glute hamstring circuits. Uh, again, I think people are a little bit deficient in those areas, so we created little just firing cir uh, circuits um, just to kind of get that extra work in. So how these work, um, each one is break, broken down into three phases. Um, and then we have about three to five exercise per phase. Uh, normally, normal prehab, rehab protocol as far as sets and reps goes with these. So it's that two to three sets, 12 to 15 reps. Um, all packages take like less than 10 minutes to complete. Um, athletes are normally asked to either come early that day, stay after lift, um, or they can come kind of randomly throughout the day as long as they have athletic clothes on to be able to complete it. Um, and then we sign off on these as they go. So this allows us to be able to document it, make sure that they're doing it. Um, and again, if we don't have a ton of hands, um, <clears throat> it kind of spreads out the work across the, uh, all of our staff between us and athletic training um, that we can make sure we keep an eye on all athletes and it's not just our red flag injured people that we're looking at. Um, allows for, uh, sorry, ensures overall workload um, and avoids potential overuse. So avoids potential overuse, again, is another big one. Um, a lot of times strength coaches are in their silo in their room and don't always communicate a ton with um, athletic trainers. Um, arm care and baseball is one of them. Obviously, a lot of people can jump in and do way too much arm care, which could be a bad thing. So that communication, having an open platform that both um, areas can look at and see what's being done is important. Uh, so again, this allows us to implement in a group, implement in a group setting, um, individualize this program. It's time efficient, um, designed in conjunction with our athletic trainers. So they help us work and, and revamp our Osprey packages every single year. We kind of reassess movement patterns and reassess um, corrective exercise that we could possibly do and we put them in there. It decreases our flow in the athletic training room. Um, sometimes our athletic training rooms aren't the biggest, uh, but they end up massively packed because obviously a lot of the practice times are the same. And a lot of them are in there just to do foam rolling and some glute firing stuff. So we try to spread that out a little bit more. They're welcome in the weight room to do that. And obviously if they can hit it at some different times um, as well, that, that kind of helps decrease that flow. And then um, we can immediately suggest packages on the fly. So if I'm seeing something in a lift or whatever it may be, I can just say, hey, add this on the back of their sheet. Right? And they'll grab their sheet and write it on the back and then we'll be good to go from there. So it's very easy, adjustable, um, and kind of a nice way to implement some of these screening numbers into that group setting. Uh, next thing we're going to go into is performance testing, just some of the performance testing that we do uh, at North Florida. It's one of the best ways to show athletes their improvements in relation to sport, um, safe and effective. Uh, one of the biggest things I always pre uh, uh, preach is your strongest lifter is not always your best player. And a lot of times, even in, in, in a sport like football, your 700 pound squatter might be sitting at the end of the bench. Um, so they're not always producing the most for, force and able to get onto the field um, and, and carry all that over into their play. Um, we have a, a record board uh, at UNF. We call it a performance board to try to keep majority of it performance based. But obviously, lifting is important for all that stuff. So we pull, still put an emphasis on that and have them in there as well. Um, ours is a dry array, so it creates that healthy competition. We constantly have some numbers flying around, so they want to see us erase it and put a new one up immediately. Um, so it works out pretty well for us creating that competition. Um, how we apply it to, to our programming, um, what we do with our performance test results, we examine our vertical and horizontal displacement forces, our single response versus multi response efforts, and then how we're translating our force onto the field or into motion in the play that we're doing every day. Um, Non-invasive testing and injury reduction. So a lot of times we'll look at right leg versus less left leg. Um, can be applied to upper versus lower as well. And then examples uh, that we use a lot is our jump mat or a contact pad. Single leg verts, um, right versus left. Single leg broad jumps, right versus left. We can have rotational um, tosses for some of the upper body sports. Um, and then I've also seen and used a little bit is some strength tests. So if you do some, some, some sub-maximal strength loads in like a rep effort Bulgarian, 
um, have, a, have a set load and see how many reps they can get on each side. Your isolateral machines, your leg extension, leg curl, um, the BioDex isokinetic machines as well, just to kind of assess some of those imbalances in the body. The jump mat is our biggest utilized one. We use this pretty much every single day in there. It's an inexpensive piece of equipment. They're usually, I think they're only around $250, $300. Um, very, very time efficient with large groups. So I can run a whole team through um, pre-lift pretty quick. Um, and we do a bunch of different testing on it. We've been evaluating data over the past three years and kind of finding what's most effective for us. So pretty much all it does is measure the time in the air from the time uh, from uh, takeoff to landing to determine your verbs. Um, why jump? Obviously, talent identification. We can see how explosive they are. Um, risk analysis and return to play. Um, can we use it for that? Yes. Um, again, we don't solely rely on that stuff. If we had money for a force plate, we would utilize something like that. Um, performance enhancement. Obviously, we want to see those numbers going up all the time. And then one of the big ones we try to look into a lot is monitoring our fatigue. Um, just some considerations. Flight times are sensitive. Um, Athletes being honest with their technique, so obviously we have to create a standard on how we jump, how we land on the mat, and we have to make sure we uphold that standard. So same thing, the same person testing the same teams all again, um, but not for sharing necessary absolute abilities. Focus on uh, consistent jump protocols. Um, effort given. So effort given is probably one of the biggest ones, especially with athletes, because they don't quite understand why we're doing it all the time. Um, but it's actually quite interesting how the results came out, and I'll show you those. Uh, but we just try to preach to them and, and educate them as much as, they, uh, as we can of why we do it to make sure they give their best effort every single time. And usually you can tell if a kid's not, and if you have a random large dip, which you'll see on some of ours, um, you can kind of kind of asterisk that day and understand that they just really didn't care too much. Um, technique faults, obviously there's a lot of technique faults that can go into it. Uh, not the most accurate but highly relatable when it comes uh, comparable to other testing. So this is a little bit of what we've been doing year one, um, was getting acclimated to it, um, kind of trying to find standards of what we wanted to do, how we wanted to kind of repeat the same jumps over and over. Year two, we pretty much just collected data. Um, just kind of collected a bunch of team data. We didn't really know how it would show up. We just kind of wanted to get all the numbers and then see what we could do out of it. And then year three, we kind of look to, to start impacting that practice a little bit more, maybe talking to coaches and say, hey, can we back this person down? Uh, maybe not run full court today or full field today. Uh, pull them out a little bit early, no contact, whatever, whatever sport you guys work with or however you can manage it. Uh, but this is done through, through communication with the sport coach. Um, the use of the information collected is obviously important to back what you're trying to say. Um, so again, it's taken us, and this was eye-opening for, for us to kind of collect a lot of data first. Um, and then you compare it to things that you see throughout the years. If people tweaked an ankle, rolled something, ended up with a serious injury, and then can kind of go from there. Um, when I plotted the points, this was year one doing it. Again, I didn't know what was going uh, gonna show up. And this looks kind of crazy um, as far as what's up there. This was our preseason non-conference play for basketball. Um, our basketball non-conference schedule is one of the, the craziest in the country as far as travel and competition-wise. Um, so I did expect it to be erratic like this, but what was interesting, what I found, is team trends. Because we just talked about all the flaws in the test, but yet there was still team trends here. When there's a dip, there's a dip with a lot of people. Or when there's a rise, there's a rise with a lot of people. So I just thought that was interesting. Again, I was just collecting points and just plotting them to see what I would show up with. Um, and, and as soon as I saw team trends like that, I said, wow, that's, that's kind of interesting. Even though there's a lot of flaws in it. And then obviously our in-season, our in, our in-conference um, schedule kind of evens out a little bit more. Um, how we do it with travel and conference, it's pretty standardized of, of when you play, um, so it tends to kind of flatten out a little bit more throughout the, in, uh, the the conference schedule as we go. Year two non-conference, as you can see, it evened out a lot more. So what I did after year one is I'm always going to evaluate myself first. So I looked at all our programming that we were giving the athletes based on the time of year, based on travel, based on games. Um, and just tried to get it, get it to even out, which it did a lot more. Um, but still, obviously, like I said, you're still seeing these team trends, which I think is, is very, very important um, to help us moving forward in the future. And then here's our uh, in-conference schedule. Um, numbers that dipped off, someone may not have been there that day or may ended up with an injury um, <clears throat> that, that just kind of skips plots there. But again, still a little bit more flat, um, obviously trending in the right direction towards the end of season type of thing. 
Um, so it's some types of tests that we do on the, on the jump mat, um, counter movement jump, non counter movement jump, right legs versus left legs. You can do a four jump, you can do depth jumps on it. Um, so there's a lot of different types of methods that you can use, whatever you want to standardize as your own or whatever you're looking to do. Um, use it for normative data. Like I said, it was most important just collecting numbers at first. Um, and then we started putting it to relation to fatigue. And it actually did show a tell with one of our bigs. Um, this guy right here. Uh, we had a kid, we lost a kid halfway through, or three quarters of the way through the year. Um, this guy's minutes went way up and that was the first week of it. So it was a direct tell. Um, and it just happened to be that his minutes went through the roof. Um, he was already playing 28, 30 minutes a game, but then he played just about 40 in that one. Um, and obviously it was a direct tell right into that. Um, <clears throat> test at the beginning of each week. So we test every Monday um, just to kind of keep it standardized. Uh, measure it year-round, we assess in-season, out-of-season, off-season, post-season, uh, just to make sure we have all those plot points so then I can kind of see um, any outliers that may tend to show up throughout the year. Um, athlete population, so this was just a study that was done um, on basketball players, the average jump height, uh, more sensitive than the highest jump in, uh, measured in fatigue and supercompensation effects. Um, previous study showed that counter movement jump offers superior sensitivity to altered neuromuscular function than other jump or sprint tests. Um, your practical application average counter movement jump performance without arm, arm swing would be more efficient um, to track that neuromuscular status um, than for some of the other tests there. Athletes must stick their landing, very, very important. If they're stepping off or moving constantly, then we don't count that jump. And you gotta make sure you be firm when they're, when, uh, when they're testing. All right? Don't be shy about it. If it's not right, it's not right. I've had kids spark really high and I just laugh. And they're like, what? I'm like, it don't count, try it again. But then they prove me wrong and they hit the same number. So hey, more power to you. You hit it twice, I mean, it, it's legit. So um, you know, there's no harm in having them jump an extra time, especially when it's quick and efficient like that. Um, when the athletes land the same way, begin their jump, uh, the score can then be raised slightly due to tendencies, um, allowing knee bend. Same <clears throat> can be for static jumps, um, but counter movements are more skilled uh, based because uh, there's obviously a lot more moving parts in it. Um, the depth may vary every single time, so obviously you want to coach that depth and create a standard. Do I want guys going like this before they vertical jump every time? You know, how do you coach it from the start? That knee and hip position is essential. Athletes who utilize their arm swing effectively are sometimes poor jumpers without arm swing. And that's very interesting to see. I've even had kids, um, their approach vert is the same as their standing vert. So obviously we're gonna look at programming with that and how we can adapt it to, to help transfer that explosive power. How the arm swing affects the, the hip and knee position. Um, athletes who utilize arm swing effectively are sometimes poor jumpers without it. Why? Two main factors. Um, properly trained athletes can create more displacement using their arms. Um, so we do a thing called snap down progression. So we'll get everybody up. We'll have them chop their hips in half and get into this set position. And then obviously want a big arm uh, arc on the way up to help carry their momentum up. Um, arm actions often create that larger hip bend. Uh, more of that folding, unfolding effect, creating more uh, time to gather force mechanically, advantage uh, position um, to produce that force as you go through it. The non counter movement jump, athlete population for this are your football linemen. Um, start each play from a static position, removes that eccentric component of the jump, allows for that fixed joint angle. Um, so obviously they're down a three point stance coming up from that fixed stance. It'd be interesting if the NFL combine started throwing the non counter movement jumps in there. Um, data quality improves when subjective uh, measures is removed. Um, and then we started getting into our right leg versus left leg testing. Um, assess the effectiveness of rehab and return to play protocols. Um, again, obviously a force plate would be best for this stuff. We do the best we can with just the jump mat. Um, and honestly, we're still just starting to collect this data. So now we've switched it up. We double leg jumped for a whole year. Um, now we're having them go through. We'll have them right first, left, and then both. Um, so we're trying to get that data throughout this year and see what we can kind of link it to based on what we've seen. Um, strength and balances could possibly affect, obviously, athlete performance, increase the risk of injury, and then athletes tend to favor a side, especially in a lot of one-sided sports. Um, perceived weakness in sport with the, where the ability to utilize both limbs um, equally could enhance performance. So just some research on that could give coaches the ability to quickly determine um, whether athlete is in the need of a training program that emphasizes the util uh, unilateral exercises. 
uh, test appears to mirror the results of more clinical assessments. Again, obviously, if we had the time, the biodex, everybody, um, 3D motion analysis, everybody, force plate, everybody, then we would take the time to do those. Uh, coaches should be cognizant of importance of assessing athletes for lower limb imbalances um, as the difference is much, maybe much larger than expected. I actually just heard Brian Mann talk about it too. Um, on um, a lot of people do vertical jump on force plates. They get them back to their, their pre-test jump height. Um, they're pushing off both legs and everything looks good. He then went and did an isometric test with them on, on a, a force plate and it was substantially different. Um, so again, the more technology-based stuff that you can get, the more ways that you can assess your athlete is obviously key. Uh, the forward jump, we don't use too, too much, but another effective tool, I just found a lot of variation in the forward jump, uh, but you pretty much just have your athlete jump four times in succession uh, as fast as they can. Um, try to get maximize their, their jump of each height and minimize ground contact time. Um, the screen will display, display uh, three numbers, the, the average ground time, the power factor, and the average height of the four jumps. Coach supervision instruction is essential to ensure consistent jump technique, um, easy to, to compromise. Um, some athletes perform greater stiffness in an effort to minimize ground contact time. So this is where I saw the big flaw. I know I always try to cheat the system. I try to prove my athletes wrong and I always want the greatest power factor. So a lot of times I would jump as high as I can on the first one and then be quick on all my other ones. So my average jump high was there, my ground contact time was low, just to try to get a big power factor. All right, but obviously people start catching on to those things and can cheat it in different ways, which is why we just stuck to the regular um, counter movement vertical jump. So again, just some of the considerations, like we said, it is effort um, based. So we need to make sure we just coach that up and get buy-in from our athletes as best as we can. Um, there are a lot of technique faults that, that do play a role in it. Um, so trying to min minimize that as much as we can. Um, we're very, very big on plyometric training, jump landing mechanics in general. So we drill it from day one that they walk in the door to make sure that this ends up being pretty consistent. But again, we still have people that go to vertical jump and literally I can't even do it. Their arms fight. <laughs> You know, it's sometimes tough to coach, which is why, again, not using the hands, taking the arms out of it is a better determination of that lower body force production. Um, again, not the most accurate, but it is highly relatable uh, when testing some of the other, other ones out there. Uh, the last thing, it isn't as much cost efficient, but Tendo units, we are lucky enough to have a couple of these. Um, we're just trying to expand our research on it, uh, of what we can do with it. So what right now we're experimenting with testing um, at certain percentages at a specific speed. Um, so looking to find where an athlete would lag uh, and then kind of trying to dial in programming for them. So we'll use it for obviously auto regulation in season. So in season, a lot of this stuff, um, what we're, we always try to assess is that X factor. We can control volume and, and, and sets and reps and stuff in the weight room. We can control it in practice by talking to the coaches, but we, we don't understand is what they're doing for the other, whatever, 20 hours of the day outside of our four countable athletic related activities. Um, so trying to assess those measures is important. So in season, there's a lot of stresses on the body that take place out of sport, uh, with school, travel, um, study, whatever it may be. Um, so that auto regulation in season, just giving them uh, a speed to hit versus a percentage off when they were, you know, out of season off a 12 week training program is a little bit more effective for us. And then again, same thing with that strongest lifter doesn't always produce the most power. So a lot of times, uh, Collins, my assistant back there, he's a bigger guy than me, can probably squat more than me. We put the same weight on the bar, I can move it faster. My vertical jump is probably better, my sprint speed's probably better, and so on. All right, so it is important that we learn how to translate that. Testing at specific percentages. So this is what we're looking at now. Um, we've selected three percentages at 40, 60, and 80%. Um, and then we've assigned a certain speed that they're supposed to hit. Um, so what we're trying to do is get a large uh, group of numbers here to kind of see if there are certain athletes lagging in certain zones. Um, so obviously if we're not hitting that, that 40% and not moving it fast enough, um, our rate of force development and our explosive power is running a little bit low. That 60% uh, might just be a little bit more of our general strength and our 80% might be a little bit more of our max strength or absolute strength. Um, so what we're trying to do is just dial in our programming to see every athlete is different. You know, how can we dial it in with them a little bit more instead of giving these blanket programs in a group setting? 
Um, we got this uh, chart off of uh, Max Schmarzo does a great job on, on social media and obviously Van Dyke as well. Um, but they had just had some of these assigned speeds to certain specific percentages. So this is what we were using to base it off of. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Uh, references here. And then obviously thank you Weber um, and thank you to my assistant Colin. Who we, we put in long hours being short staffed this semester uh, trying to get this stuff done and then traveling down here to, to get it done. So. chance to get to say, hey, how you doing? You know, where are you from? What's your major? Um, so I think it's a little bit of both. You can definitely familiarize yourself with the, with the athletes. Um, but we talked about that 80-20 rule, so we definitely implement it as well. So um, I, I found it, I have always found it as a great time to get that one-on-one, -on -one, because usually we do it as soon as they get back on campus, um, kind of create that connection that, you know, can have an influence down the road on. Um, I started off FMS with the teams that I had had, um, and then we expanded a few genetics that we put into all sports. But what about the, uh, the just jump mat? Uh, just jump mat, we do it just about every sport. Okay. There's only like one or two, we don't do it with track, which is surprising, but they, track is one of those sensitive ones. Um, we never really do much plyometric stuff with them because they do so much out there. Um, so we don't do it with them, our distance athletes. Um, I mean, we had golfers doing it, we had just about everybody doing it. Would you consider broad jump as well? Or Absolutely. Absolutely. And then a lot of people are doing the three jump, the um, double to single to single. So yeah, we, we, we assess all that stuff as well. The, the regular broad jump we have on our performance board, we assess that. Um, but we're starting to look into more of that three jump to get obviously different types on it as well. What's like the um, protocol for the weekly jump test? Is it like everyone gets three jumps, they wait like 10 seconds in between type thing? We usually, we've been going two and we ran through the whole team and before they went the second time. Um, just this year we started switching to the right, left, both. Um, and that one's been about a three second in between. Is that like cold straight before they warm so up? Or? We do a warm up every time. So that's been the biggest thing is yeah. do you standardize that warm up? Yeah. Um, we don't really standardize it. I mean, our what I consider our effective movements that we like to hit before everything. I had a coach one tell me, time tell me, hey, you know, can you switch the warm-up? Uh, coach, I don't know. All right, I'll switch it up. We pulled the groin that day. I never switched it up since. Um, but there, I, have, I have my certain essentials I need to hit, so I hit those. Um, our muscle firing might change a little bit because uh, normally how we set up our lifts, we'll have warm-up and we'll have our movement prep, which is kind of like our muscle firing to prepare us for that day. Um, but we'll always do that stuff prior to it so that they're definitely awoke for it. Um, why jump that when there's other force plates out there? Price. Price. It was accessible to me. There, force plates now are starting, and there's a ton of people looking into it. They're, they're starting to get a lot cheaper. Um, you can get them at, at Walmarts. I actually heard someone just talk to me about uh, turning one of the connect or Wii boards into a, a force plate. Um, so there's a lot that you can do with it. It's definitely something we are, are dialing in 100% on. Um, I'm going to try not to go the, the, the cheap route and, and kind of make something like that. Um, biggest thing and the uh, um, thing that I can give to you guys the most is get, use your resources that you have. So the biggest thing I'm trying to do is get into our academics department, um, figure out what they have and see if we can collaborate on something. We're trying to get research grants and see if we can get some money that way. Well, going back to validity of using the jump mat, what would be better for the athlete if you had the money to purchase something other than I mean, starting from a whole, I'd say everything. So if you could get a 3D motion analysis, have four Kistler force plates to be able to test on that. Um, and then the types of tests you choose when you do it. Um, so obviously jumping is one thing, but those isometric strength holds. Um, another thing I just started at the conference recently was they didn't train uh, a women's soccer group on conditioning at all, but they trained um, eccentric and isometric strength uh, and their beat test times improved um, just in turns and things like that. So it all depends what you're looking for. Um, there's so much out there, and I think uh, the biggest thing is, is catapult. Everybody, everybody wants catapult and gets it. A lot of sport coaches want it. Big schools fund it. 
they get it, they say, hey, strength coach, learn it. Okay, I learn everything about it and turn to the coach and say, what do you want to know? I'm like, what do you mean? It's a system, tell me what I need to know. There's so many metrics and so many things out there that you can figure out. So it's just dialing in with what, what you think will work best for your program and pick, pick what's most practical for your program. Thank you. Thank you guys, appreciate it.